Hey everybody, welcome to the Witness Underground podcast. This is episode 21, we could call it season 2, episode 1. I meet up in Miami in person with Kate Krujalis, who is a new person on the podcast. She and I connected over the film, which is really cool. We met each other online originally through Minneapolis, old friends of ours that are connected. Also, the very first person I did this project with, where I released an episode on the series, was Ross Wilkins. And we decided on a late night call, we were having a lot of fun, and we're like, Kate's like, let's let's fly him in. And so I was staying in Miami for a while. Ross flies in, we have a bunch of days together. So on the last day, we had a little catch-up conversation as a podcast episode. And they're awesome and fun, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. We get into a lot of really interesting things. It was a kind of a whirlwind experience all hanging out for the first time. Kate and I both lived with Ross for over a year. He lived with her in Nicaragua in her colonial house when they were both still in the religion, kind of their last-ditch effort to be a part of it. And then just were repulsed more by how the religion acts. Yeah, that, my time in Nicaragua definitely sparked my exit from that cult. Being part of a religion and rubbing shoulders with sort of the colonialism aspect of it opened my eyes at the time to aspects of the religion that I was finding repulsive. Yeah, it totally was. <laughs> <laughs> we all exited our cult after seeing how they operate internationally, so we kind of dive into that repulsive colonial aspects of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So this is a Ross Wilkins catch-up, an introduction to Kate Kujalis and her projects. Ross has a brand new cafe. He and his life partner, Ernest Coe, are building together called Queer Plants Cafe. So we go into a deep dive about what his big project is. And if you watch the first episode of the whole series, the, the Meet Ross episode, he has gone to school at that point. He's in school for botany and landscaping design and did that for a career already. So now we're catching up with him as he's transitioning to something related in a sense, but something he's always wanted to do is run a cafe. We were talking about it when we lived together when we were in our early 20s. So it's kind of cool to see it all come together. And then we all experience the Argentina World Cup in a little place of North Beach, Miami, where there are over 10,000 people from Argentina and it was amazing and insane. So we get into that. Ross has some really funny Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy jokes. Whole planet of humans defining <laughs> the end of their culture with one act of kicking a ball through a net and then exploding all of their resources as fireworks into the sky and then dying out. <laughs> <laughs> what? I was there for Art Basel with Kate, so we had that experience together at the beginning of December. That was amazing. There's also Spectrum, Red Dot, and crazy NFT parties with Alex Gray art installations, and that was amazing. And then we get into some deeper global ecosystem changes and sea level rise and how that's all going to change things. And Miami's right at the sea level. So it's kind of interesting to be in a city where it's right at the heart of the problem. And then some regional initiatives for sustainability. And then our path to realizing that we were atheists and how that went and what creating your own set of ethics is like. (laughs) <laughs> the overwhelming theme of the Bible is human violence. Yeah. Sure, pick out a couple of sentences in the Bible that have Jesus saying nice things or something. God solves all of his problems by violence. Not love or connectedness or respect for nature. And if you actually read the fucked up commandments, God would actually be put to death under his own rules. <laughs> under his own law his so called perfect law God would be put to death don't people think of that so it's just based on authoritarianism mm. if it's deciding to use violence to solve all of its problem it's, it's amoral in our modern lives how do we live in a way that's harmonious and fulfilling you have to be ethical queer plants cafe come and get a coffee a sandwich a plant <laughs> Pollinate your universe. Enter my plantacy. <laughs> Keep rolling. This is fun. We'll do a really crazy <laughs> Ross's experience with Black Lives Matter and Kate gets into some reproductive rights, ballot initiatives, how to form your own ethics. Her ballot initiative business is really interesting as well, and we dive into that. It's a really cool project that is tapping into easily one of the most exciting and interesting parts of the United States democracy. It only exists in 20 states. I learned about it during Occupy. I got really involved in that social movement in 2011. We talked deeply about how that works and and why it's important to pay attention if you live in a state that has that ability to change the law through the populace. 
I hope you stick with us for the episode and thanks again for tuning in. This is a, our first launch of the year since I'm living in Bocas del Toro in Panama and Panama City. I'm working remotely to do this project and get the film released and keep the podcast going for a season two. So thanks again for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Give us feedback, like, subscribe, enjoy. Check out witnessunderground.com about artists who've escaped cults. We have three different forms of journalism from a film a YouTube series, and a podcast. The podcast is very active. We're launching season two, January 2023. And the story link on that site talks about the body of work that we've already created and what we're continuing to create, the mission, the intention, and our artist grant application where you can submit to take home $1,000 to work on your art project on the topic. The only criteria would be that you have a great idea, that our panel awards but also that you have some association with this particular religion, Jehovah's Witnesses, at some point in your life. doesn't matter how long it's been. And we also have a blog, a regular writing series. The press has been really interesting. When we did our film festival run in 2021, we got a lot of press. We are on a lot of radio programs and a lot of podcasts. And you can see all of that content there, which is really exciting. And it's fun to have launched this new website. And the art page will have shortly all of our products we have for sale from t-shirts to the music from all the bands in the film to artists who are actively making new music that we've highlighted on the podcast and films that you can watch from other activists. It's an exciting time to be launching the grant and the new site and the film. That should be out in April. We're launching it. The target date for release is ahead of the Jehovah's Witness holiday that they call the Memorial and the Jewish people call the Passover event. So April 4th is the actual date, and we are shooting for ahead of that for a public release, ideally on ad-based services such as Tubi for you to watch. So stay, stay ahead of that, pay attention to the website, subscribe on the website, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and search on YouTube for Witness Underground Podcast. That's where we've been launching everything. We have just launched on Buzzsprout as a distribution, so we should be on Spotify shortly. Thank you so much for following. Like, subscribe, share as much as you can. And let any artist that you know who has any affiliation with this religion, that they can apply for the $1,000 grant that we are putting together as a goodwill to the community and an exciting way to bring new art to the community that is part of the healing process. Check out witnessunderground.com. Cult Hackers is a podcast I would love all of you to support. They have a Patreon. It's run by a father-daughter team. Media graduate Celine and former cult member now organizational psychologist Stephen explore how cults work, why they are so dangerous, and the experience of leaving and making sense of the world. They speak to cult hackers from all over the world, from ex-members to academics, from writers to filmmakers, from therapists to activists. It's a podcast about cult hacking, cracking the cult code to understand what they are, how they work, and how people leave, and how to make sense of the world after leaving. They get into Star Wars, the radicalization of the Skywalkers and the Jedi cult, Children of God, Family Survival Trust, what it's like to have holidays if you grew up in a cult that did not allow them. It can be a very strange time. They bring in other activists. They've got the director of apostasy, one on Justified Ancients of Mumu and the KLF with Jex, it's Riley. He's another activist. I think this podcast is easily one of the most interesting and diverse and it's fun in the father-daughter combo of different generations. It just works, and I think it's refreshing. Definitely check them out. They have a Patreon. It's only a dollar. They put out a ton of content. They're podcast machines, and I think they've just really nailed their organization and their flow, and I support them, and I would like other people to support them. I want them to be able to keep doing this. Their Patreon's a great way to do that. You can also listen to them everywhere that podcasts are available. I see Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple, and there's a whole bunch more, so... Definitely check out Cult Hackers. Audience, this is Witness Underground Podcast. Today we're in Miami. Yeah. With Kate Kujalis and Ross Wilkins. Welcome to Miami. <laughs> Miami, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Miami or <are> bust. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh. You're so generous. You come to my house, you know I'll smoke you out. <laughs> well, actually, my boyfriend will. <laughs> Yeah, a little time capsule. Time capsule, I like that. Cool, like a moment in time. Yeah. <sighs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So I introduced you, but maybe you can tell us what we're doing here, Kate. What's going on in Miami? What brought you to Miami? Oh man, just the, the spice of the city. Um, I moved here two years ago. It was kind of like pandemic move. 
um, getting closer to the tropics. Uh, it's just a great place to live. What's your day to day? What's my day to day? I wake up, I let my dog out, then I eat some food and I go for a swim. And then I connect with friends, walk around the neighborhood, make some art, try to work, and then I do it all again. We'll get into your work. You have a really cool project coming up. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Ross, what are you doing here? I just recently left a seven-year career as a full-time gardener. I was working six days a week, approximately five hours a day, physical labor, <laughs> and I suddenly became 42 years old and my body hurt every day. <laughs> <laughs> I currently live in Portland, Oregon though. One of my new concepts in my life that I would like to undertake is opening my own business, starting up my own business. I feel like I'm ready for the next adventure. What's your business? Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, in concept it's simple, but kind of surprising to people. It's a small plant shop with a cafe coffee shop together, fully integrated. And I think what will make it stand out is my color palette's very, very bright, very tropics. <laughs> and I've traveled the world and s been to a lot of cafes so I kind of have this idea of what I want a cafe experience to mean to me based on being in cafes all over the planet and I also want to make mine different and special and that's going to be what I think it's going to be the trademark of the cafe it's going to be called Queer Plants Cafe it's going to be a safe space for LGBTQ plus community members, just everyday shoppers. It's going to have a selection of smaller houseplants, mostly pots, accessories, little things. And we're going to have great locally roasted coffee, breakfast sandwiches, some salads. The design, which I'm mostly a designer, and so the design that I'm sticking with is going all out fantasy. I'm going to have magical LED floating clouds going through the whole the whole ceiling that are on a Bluetooth a Bluetooth control system, and they can display millions of colors at a time. So the ceilings are going to have lights and clouds and like rainbow thunderstorms. <laughs> hanging plants the epoxy floor is going to be like the Caribbean ocean or the waves and I want to create just while you're sitting there drinking your coffee you're going to be looking out at a complete jungle and you can buy the jungle <laughs> it's for sale <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to make a Shit's Creek joke we watched David from Shit's Creek, David Rose with Rose Apothecary. He had this really poorly thought out plan. He couldn't even write it down to the guy. It sounds like you've come a long way compared to you. Yes, my life partner <laughs> and my business partner, Ernest Co., were combining our distinctly different yet similar experiences in our careers. So I came from a background of restaurants. I've worked in over a dozen restaurants in my life. And I've been a prep cook a couple of times, dishwasher, server, bartender. I've been a hotel manager. I've worked in at least 40 businesses, maybe more. Uh, so I feel like I have a really well-rounded experience with restaurant concepts and what makes them thrive or what makes them die. So I kind of have that part dialed in a little bit. My partner, grew up in Tampa and got a culinary degree in French fine cooking and further went on to study in California and has worked at many restaurants himself and managed restaurants, managed a brunch cafe in Savannah 
and worked at a fine French restaurant in Tampa and has worked at restaurants in the Portland area, was a full-time sushi chef for five years and has just a well-rounded restaurant experience and background. With my gardening experience, I took a two-year degree and learned at least 800 different plant species. And I also worked in a nursery, so I learned a lot of the indoor plants. And I think that experience is probably the one I'm going to rely the hardest on setting this all up, mm-hmm. is the working at the nursery. Sounds exciting. Yeah. When? When are we going to be able to go to Portland and go to your cafe? A really bad time to open a business is in the month of December, because that's when your LLC taxes are due. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be really stupid to open a business two weeks before the new year. Also, for the same reasons, that's when businesses call it quit after they've done their taxes uh-huh. and realized that they're not making any money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great time to grab um, someone diving out of their lease. And so we're kind of waiting for the new year. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully February. Wow, that's really soon. Yeah. I was expecting you to say somewhere in the summer, just because how, how much work it takes to start something like that. We're planning on taking about one month for the remodel of mm-hmm. a standard 1,100 to 1,400 foot cafe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Why are you in Miami? That was my actual question. <laughs> <laughs> well, because... Two how of, is Miami for you? Because two of my wonderful friends got me the ticket. I'm currently unemployed (laughs) and it was the perfect time to get out of Portland, get out of the gloom, get out of the clouds and get some sun and see my friends. Describe it. Describe your experience in Miami so far. Absolutely wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) I will never forget the Argentina World Cup win which i attended the game at the local bar here on the rocks for the on record the rocks. <laughs> place is legendary otrs, OTRs. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing the there were how many thousands of argentinian people partying in the streets all of them <laughs> <laughs> um let's just let's just throw out a number let's say 50,000 people were in the streets last night. I don't know if it that's was an, true. That's it was a at, big number. It was at least, at least, I would say at least 10K in terms of like how many people were coming in and out of the street, like keeping that thing, the machine going. People were chanting the same 20 songs for... Oh uh, yeah, it was It was like 10 hours. four <laughs> to five city blocks that were just like jam-packed with people. It was like, amazing. So somewhere between yeah. 10 and 50,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> There's, they could fill an Argentinian stadium with the people in this town who are from actually Argentina. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> people standing on the rooftops of businesses like Walgreens. Flying flags. Yeah. Um, Jumping. People taking off their clothes. Just piles and piles and piles of trash and beer bottles and glitter and explosions. <laughs> Bikini ladies, flags. All the goodness. Tons of Chance. percussion, lots of drummers <laughs> keeping the thing moving. Drumming, drum circles. Yeah, it was the whole smorgasbord of World Cup fun. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> what, what I didn't know coming into the situation was that Argentina was waiting on this victory for 37 years. At least that's what I heard. So that's pretty... That's a 37 years of party coming out in one night. Oh yeah! <laughs> it was cool to watch it because I, <laughs> I came here two weeks ago for Art Basel, and we went to four, uh, three games leading up to the World Cup at different Argentinian restaurants. That so was so cool to see these little micro groups in all these different restaurants around the neighborhood and around town, sort of just going all out just inside the restaurant. And then leaving the restaurant afterward to celebrate and have the drums and had the chants already sitting on chairs, sitting on tables, cheering every time someone, every time Argentina gets the ball, like start a new song. It's amazing. But then see it all come together at the end and have them win was incredible. 
And the game, you know, going approximately 30 or 40 minutes over time was quite intense. Um, and it just came down to that one last little kick. <laughs> oh, something you've been saying yeah. this whole time is like, humans just get really excited when they kick a ball into a net. <laughs> what, is this how we, you're going to sum up the human species? <laughs> In my mind, it's like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy moment where you describe a whole planet of humans with dwindling resources and explosions of population, defining <laughs> the end of their culture with one act of kicking a ball through a net and then <laughs> exploding all of their resources as fireworks into the sky and then dying out. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> it, it's just like that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy type joke that keeps going in my head <laughs> in the book he says something like i wrote an entire manual over 15 years while being on planet earth about what a human species is like but the editors at the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy foundation edited all of my writing down to two words mostly harmless <laughs> <laughs> that's the only entry earth gets <laughs> <laughs> Loves kicking ball into net. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a ball going into a net is <laughs> pure elation. Is a ten-hour non-stop party where all the beer in the neighborhood is depleted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the stores had to like stop taking credit because they were running out of products, so they were just like, "Oh my gosh." I, I actually assumed really early on in the day that that would happen, for mm -hmm. sure. That they would not have enough stock to keep that party going. Yeah. Yeah, my neighborhood <laughs> is largely Argentinian. <laughs> we noticed. <laughs> uh, but it was, it's so fun, and the people are so beautiful and fun, and... Everyone had a big smile on their face all day long. Yeah. And it's coming out of a pandemic that's something so special to see everybody just happy and not caring about COVID and not caring about politics <laughs> and just is celebrating something so simple as a ball going into a net. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, why are you in Miami? I came to Art Basel, and Kate, you graciously invited me to come hang out and see what it's all about. I thought Art Basel was going to be like an event with like one building, one thing happening. But it turned out that there's the entire city erupts in art exhibitions with Red Dot. Spectrum was another. Art Basel is super high end, global level top artists. And then Red Dot and Spectrum are like, I don't know, half the price or something. And then, but they're like interesting. All the artists were there. That was really cool to like tour their art and see it, interact with them. And then you have graffiti live on the Winwood walls of a whole, the whole neighborhood. That was amazing to watch and uh, experience to see the art, but also see it happening as well. Like everywhere, everyone had a, not everyone, but a lot of people had paint cans and like little depots of artists like hanging out with their pile of art supplies, ready to tag the city. The whole city's covered in little micro tags and huge tags. It's so cool. I love graffiti. Like my, like my photography school end of year thing I did was all about graffiti artists in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really cool to see a city alive with graffiti that's sort of celebrated more than, than suppressed. Or like LA, there's graffiti, but it's like people are running <laughs> from the police. And here the police are like protecting it and keep like, there's like three cop cars parked in the corner while people are actually painting the walls and making sure that like, there's no, nothing crazy happening. The graffiti is like a part of the city. I thought that was really cool. Cool NFT galleries and like my NFT friends from LA were out here doing crazy stuff. They invited us to a couple parties. That was crazy to see. Like really cool to see. Like Alex Gray had installed art at this swank party on the ocean at this mansion. And it was just fun. DJs. Who was there? Grimes was there. We're like in their dressing room. Yeah, like, in their bedroom, yeah, like, <laughs> like, watching them do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the city is just, oh, drugs are okay on the podcast. <laughs> it's fine. Well, in that case. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, it's funny. Uh, I also have a mini grime story. <clears throat> I stayed at the Madonna Inn in San Luis Obispo, and the room I chose out of the 75 theme rooms was rock bottom. It was basically a really gothic cave room. And as I checked in and sat on the sofa, I looked up the room online and I saw a Grimes video where she was making a music video on the very same couch in which I was sitting at that moment. I couldn't stop screaming. (laughs) I was sitting right where she was sitting right when she was doing the video and it was so weird. (laughs) In a cave. I love that. In a cave. (laughs) A cave hotel room. Nice. I have pictures. (laughs) <laughs> I think the coolest thing about Miami I mean the art in the, the city is interesting you have a really cool neighborhood North Beach is so chill I do yeah I like it a lot and the nature like people think of Miami as well there's a lot of opinions about Miami but to see it like just jump in the ocean a few blocks away on the dailies or just go walk on the shoreline to get your feet wet it's like it's so cool and the, the cityscape looks like futuristic the architecture is really interesting the weather's warm, there's fresh air from the breeze coming through from the ocean. The water's nice and comfortable. You don't really ever need a jacket. Like it's a little cool sometimes at night, but it's just like comfortable almost all the time. It's so funny when it gets cold here. Like everyone in Miami dresses super good. They go out to impress, mm-hmm. except when it's cold, like they have no idea how to layer. So they pull like the jacket that they've been wearing for like 10 to 15 years out. And it's just like <laughs> ugly and frumpy. <laughs> like, everyone looks like shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> it drops below 70. <laughs> oh my God. It was exactly the same in Hawaii when I lived there. Um, it, at one point in Hawaii, it became somehow, bizarrely, became like 54 degrees. Mm. And people were walking around in coats that they looks like they pulled out of a Goodwill bin 30 years ago. <laughs> and earmuffs and mittens and scarves. At, and it was only 50, like 54, maybe 52 degrees. <laughs> when it happens in LA too, where you have like a perfectly sunny day in, in, in one of the winter months where it gets into the 60s. And people will put on full, like, Inuit outfits with, like, furry, hooded, (laughs) puffy jackets with mittens and earmuffs or whatever. And and it's, there'll be someone next to them in a bikini. (laughs) So they're doing yoga and you're like, this is so, like, this is the outfit you'd wear in the Arctic or Minnesota during the peak winter where we're from. So funny. (laughs) Also, just an interesting thing about Miami despite, you know, it's despite it being a confluence of cultures and tropics and fun, it's probably one of the lowest at sea level cities in the United States, which puts it in the direct path of climate change. So I find it fascinating to be part of a city that might not be around in my lifetime. Oh, absolutely. It's like one of the exciting things about living here. Mm-hmm. And like everyone knows it. And the yeah. innovation, like uh, like going into how we're going to keep the city alive. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> due to like, like you said, climate change. It's, it's cool. There's a lot of like smart minds coming together and trying to solve a problem, this problem. Mm-hmm. The amount of infrastructure to elevate all the sewage, roads, water, drainage, everything they may or may not solve that. It's so much infrastructure. What's the sea level rise expected? 20 something feet in the next 50 years or something? They're finding that the glaciers, their estimates were completely wrong and they're melting at a much faster rate than any of... They have this like strange sort of Washington DC politics figure where they're always pushing climate change 50 years out. They like to push it. Fi- they're constantly saying in fifty years. Mm. Um, well, of course they'll all, they'll all be dead. All those people <laughs> <laughs> running the, running the show, right? right. The, the government. They'll all be dead. So it's almost like 
this thing, but they know that we don't really have 50, 50 years for the oceans to rise. So it, Miami has to innovate quick. And that's like interesting to me. And I, I like being here at this sort of like moment in time where it's almost like going to Vegas right before they shut off the lights. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Right. So I, I think that's fascinating yeah. because <clears throat> if you do become old, that would be a really fun to- story to tell when you're 80, right? <laughs> that you had the time of your life in Miami and now it's totally under 30 feet of water. They'll be like, Grandma, what's Miami? <laughs> <laughs> The underwater sea museum <laughs> of the apocalypse. <laughs> well, the so-called doomsday glacier, which is, I believe, in West Antarctica, it maybe Southwest Antarctica. It's dubbed doomsday because it's a glacier that's sort of like a bathtub plug. It's like the plug when you unplug it out, all the other glaciers will drain out of the Mm. bathtub so to speak and they put sensors into the core of that glacier that they recently had a, a voyage to get back out to collect data and they found that the temperature of the water underneath the glacier is at 34 degrees fahrenheit oh no it's because there (laughs) is a huge conveyor belt so the planet has to diffuse all of this heat right from co2 and in order to do that it sends the heat down into the oceans that's where it's absorbed into the water and the water has to diffuse just like everything else has to diffuse it's just the law of physics and so a conveyor belt of hot co2 atmosphere water is basically melting Antarctica directly right now. Mm. And it's melting at a very, very, very fast pace because it's melting the glaciers from underneath. Mm. Scientists were only thinking about direct melting from above. Mm. They didn't realize how warm the water could possibly get under the oceans like that. So that's sort of the new the new data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did avalanche, um, in Colorado, I did an avalanche safety course. We measured, you you cut a hole, you cut a wall out of the snow down to the earth and you put thermometers through out it at different, like, you might, you can see layers where ice had been or snow is and you like put thermometers in just to check what the temperature is. And what was interesting to me coming from a snowy place is that earth's temperature in Wisconsin, Minnesota, the ice goes down like three or four feet in the winter time. And in Colorado, no, it doesn't do that. But the earth, like the snow at the level of the dirt was almost always around 32 or just above freezing or just below freezing. With, above that, it could be much colder. It would be the air temperature, more closer to the air temperature. And you're trying to check for like, if you pat the snow, like where, when you test this like tower of snow that you like, you, you shovel out a tower of snow and you like, pad it with a shovel and you see where it breaks away so you kind of know like where the avalanche would start if it was going to start while you're skiing across it or snowboarding but it, it was interesting to think like earth temperature is like sort of stable mm-hmm. or if you've ever been in a cave you go underneath the earth it's like cold but consistently cold yeah like at a certain depth it's sort of like that wine cellar yeah, effect exactly. where it's like always 52 degrees or something right. like that yeah you need a jacket to, to like be comfortable but yeah it's also warmer than the air outside. Yeah. It's winter time. I yeah. mean... It's interesting to think that, like, the oceans and then the land masses are kind of uniformly warm. Yeah, like, they're... I mean, the world governments know this is happening, obviously, and they're they're trying to mitigate this with a new concept where they actually um, purposefully block out sunlight by spraying some chemical in the upper atmosphere to deflect light from the earth. Um, (laughs) Can we not do that? It sounds like a bad start to a sci-fi. I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like a, like a chemtrails nightmare or something to me, Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I know cloud seeding to create rain um, is a different concept and it's not very effective. Um, but in essence, they're going to sort of mimic the, the effect of a volcano, a very, maybe a very powerful volcano. But um, plants are sensitive to light too. So, I mean, if they inadvertently do it wrong, they could kill a lot of the Earth's plant life as well. Um, it's hard to say mm-hmm. if they have the, the data to like prevent that from happening, but so I don't know like, what's worst case scenario. Cause worst case scenario, how, how far does the water rise on earth? I think it's 236 meters of water than now. It so could potentially go much higher. So if it. all of the ice on earth melts, there's no more Washington DC. It's totally underwater. That's pretty inland. That's pretty inland, yeah. yeah. So if all of the glaciers on Earth melt, it displaces 40% of the Earth's population. Yeah, I mean, every major city in the world a 40, is on a river. Yeah. And most of them are on the coastline. A 40% shock of displacement due to the oceans rising like that would probably start like a World War Three. Yeah, there'd be resources. That I don't see how I don't see how society would to, wouldn't would total would manage a forty yeah. percent loss of habitat. And a lot of agriculture is at river deltas around the world, which would then just be well, deep all of the, the ocean. all of the for all of the plant life would die because of saltwater contamination and drainage, you know, from the seas. Um, can't wait. <laughs> 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 I think it's fascinating. Mm. I like this. I like the science behind it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's important to talk about. Yeah, it's cool. I think there's a huge shift from what we grew up with. Like in last century, people were talking about this. Since the '70s, people have been talking about climate change and like ap- carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But it was the media, owned by big corporate interests, would say it's not true, and then there'd be debates about whether or not it's true, or even like. What was it? Al Gore's documentary that he put out about climate change was like super controversial, and that was only twenty years ago. And now it's we have with a COP fifteen in Montreal. They're talking the whole world, every single government on Earth is coming together to like create a document how we're going to limit ecosystem destruction and collapse in their own countries. Like that's a huge progress in the last fifteen years. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's just. It's just a shame that it wasn't something that was taken seriously sooner mm-hmm. before there, you know, the damage would be so extensive. I think the, I think the part that really makes me upset is that, um, botanists and scientists have always told the governments of the world to protect the Amazon rainforest because it's the lungs of the planet. And their leader, Bolsonaro, who's now replaced, thankfully, was chopping down the rainforest as fast as humanly possible. And, and letting it burn as well. Burning it and all. also encouraging more ranching to cut down Destroying, more destroying, destroying. And mm-hmm. so the, all of the plant gases that come out of that rainforest seed the clouds that go all over the planet. Mm-hmm. That's where the rain cycle originates and the oxygen cycle. And it's been burned down. So seeing all these major planetary river systems dry up has been worrying to me about that. Um, So it's going to be a tough, tough hike for humanity from here on. (laughs) Now they're saying they're going to protect the rainforest and maybe try to restore it. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Plants grow really fast in the tropics, which is nice. They do. So hopefully something good will happen from their new president. One thing I like about COP15, what's happening, the talks are happening in Montreal, and this is not action, this is just politics talking about doing something someday, but trying to like create a, a standard, that a global standard is one of, one of the key things they all have agreed on, which is, there's only a couple things they've all agreed on, there's a lot of arguments and discussion, is saving, protecting 30% of every nation, which I think it should be more. But right now, like with state parks and national parks in our country, it's something like less than 5%, probably less than 1% of the land is protected. 
where it, could, it should be reversed in my opinion. Like we should not have license to destroy 99% of the land or like mine it or extract it or manipulate it. Like we should protect more than that of wild places. Like protect wetlands or whatever. So having all nations agreeing that like 30% is a reasonable number to achieve. Sounds like a really huge push in the right direction if they actually do it. Yeah, we'll see. The I mean, the planet's population is supposed to start going into decline, thankfully, um, because some of the world's major nations have low birth rates. Um, so hopefully that will help a little bit. Maybe we'll be able to turn some of these empty buildings back into forests or swamps or pastures or whatever mm-hmm. they were naturally before. We'll see. It's hopeful. <laughs> One of the cool things I got to see in Denver, and our, our friend is involved in some of this, was um, there's a law in place for the last, since, since the new governor, I can't remember his name, he started Star, he started this startup incubator there, and he's the governor of Colorado, but they had this new law put in place where every business has to, within five years, achieve a certain amount of green energy or, or sustainability uh, infrastructure with their with their land and if they can't do it they can buy another company's over production of green energy or like they put solar on the roof or they can put a greenhouse on the roof or they can they have to like insulate like get new windows that are super efficient or change their power system to be green not based on coal or whatever and seeing the city change through that having like the old factory district where all the breweries are they also have like greenhouses that are producing food on the roof that kind of thing. So interesting to see like an old factory city on the old railways from the 1800s turn into this kind of innovative, transformed town. Yeah, it's possible. It's great. We could have hydroponic systems on our balconies in our apartments. We could have solar panels on our rooftops. We could recycle our gray water instead of just sending it downstream. We could harvest the rainwater instead of letting it wash away. Um, So those are all things that are not happening and they're very attainable with the resources we still have today. So I think that's good. Um, I have mixed feelings about electric cars right now. I think people think that it's a panacea, but only like 17% of our planet's pollution comes from car pollution. So it's... 17% 17% is something, but it's not It's not going to save the planet. <laughs> I think, like, the, the extraction process, though, to, like, achieve that oil or that gas is, like, probably more damaging, don't you think? And actually, like... Oh, definitely the mining industry is notorious for pollution. Lithium mines, cobalt... All of those, especially cobalt. And you're talking about even oil, just oil extraction itself. Yeah, I wonder, yeah. I wonder if like that goes into that percentage or if that's on top of it. Mm. It's hard to say. I mean, they're just sort of coming out in mass now. What, statistics? Or what? No, the electric cars. Oh, yeah. The factories are kind of coming online right now with like all the new electric mm-hmm. cars. So it'll be interesting to see the okay. type of pollution that amounts with that. There's new battery technology that's coming online with, I think, Tesla's pioneering. That's no cobalt. I can't remember what it is. It's different. Like salt or something. But there's always going to be something. Like, there's always going to be a bottleneck. That ha- like, science or industry has to achieve something outside of that bottleneck or around it. Yeah, and most likely there will be massive scientific breakthroughs that will innovate all of our technology again. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you can't rely too much on that, but... They're already starting up projects. They're start. Do you know the geothermal project? Mm-mm. They're actually trying to dig to the core of the planet to to get what? heat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Read there was some some yeah. hole in Italy. They drilled like seven thousand feet or some or seven miles or something. It, it, it was, was like crazy. seven miles, I I believe. Yeah. I just That's read it. That's insane. Yeah. yeah, and if they tap into that magma core, mm-hmm. it's basically the generator that powers the entire world. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally cool. The mental image and it's, is like really good. <laughs> it's sort of like me, but I don't, I mean, wouldn't that be a volcano? Right, I was going to say, wouldn't yeah. you poke a hole in that? Doesn't it just like destroy Italy? <laughs> That's how the world ends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <a> <laughs> <mark>. <laughs> I don't quite understand. 
Me either. Maybe it'll be a fission generator or fusion generator. Maybe they don't have to get to molten, explosive, lava, magma, but they can just get to warmer than Earth, Earth's surface. It's hard to say. Uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one thing we didn't talk about, and it's seemingly out of order, but that's okay. How did you two meet each other? Uh, Nicaragua. <laughs> yeah, I was living in in Leon, Nicaragua, in like two thousand eight, I think, um, and I was like eighteen, super young, super stupid, and <laughs> someone <laughs> said there was this guy that was coming from Minneapolis who like needed a ride to Leon or something like that. I don't know. So my roommates and I like went to this mall in Managua to find this dude that we didn't know what he looked like and it was Ross <laughs> <laughs> we brought him back and he stayed like for months <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe three around three months or something I I was on like a sabbatical <laughs> I was at the time I was part of the Jehovah's Witness religion it was the original religion I was raised in this was 2008, and I I was on a sabbatical in Nicaragua to basically learn Spanish in an immersive environment and enjoy tropical weather. And Kate Kate's was living with two roommates, um, Brandy and Grady, and they were the ones that I made. I emailed them, and I sight unseen <laughs> and decided to rent their a room in their Spanish colonial home in the city of Leon, Nicaragua. It was such a cool house. It was a beautiful, oh. gorgeous house. When you walked in, there was a grand ballroom yeah. with not a, not a scrap of furniture in it. <laughs> wow. It became the projector room, actually. I don't know if you were there for that. There, yes, I was. I was the one who suggested the idea <laughs> Thank you, <Ross. laughs> to Grady. <laughs> I talked him into it. Um, yeah, it was it was a gorgeous place. It had an op- an open air garden, two open air garden areas, yeah, two courtyards, two courtyards. Like colonial. The building surrounds an open courtyard in between. Yeah, mm-hmm. so you walk in through the ballroom and then you'd you'd continue into the house, which you know like extended about a half block basically. It's insane. It was um, a, a ginormous house. Wow. Yeah, and it was, the bedrooms were, were like, on one end of the courtyard, so, like, I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd just, like, look out the window at the banana tree in my courtyard, it was, it was amazing. There were bananas and a couple other ornamental plants. Mm-hmm. It was so, it was so nice. Hammocks everywhere. Hammocks, Spanish books, I had a lot of romance novels. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Historical fiction. <laughs> I love historical fiction. <laughs> Some of the great writers. I read. I read One Hundred Years of Solitude. There, I read the the original Arabian Nights children's mm. story, which is over a thousand pages. Wow. <laughs> it was quite entertaining. It was a it was a grand old time. <laughs> <laughs> that was Miami. It was a grand old time. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, though, I was, you know, I was involved in sort of this missionary house. I wasn't a missionary myself or dedicated to that cause, but seeing it through kind of this, you know, Nicaragua was a very poor country with quite a, a low standard of, at the time I was there anyways, quite a quite a poverty rate that was alarming and being part of a religion and rubbing shoulders with sort of the colonialism aspect of it kind of opened my eyes at the time to aspects of the religion that I kind of was finding repulsive like being a rich white person from America with a big family inheritance and showing up in Nicaragua as a missionary, renting the most fabulous house in the city and flaunting your money to everybody there and trying to convert them to your religion. I found that distasteful 
myself. Yeah, it totally was. <laughs> <laughs> like the picture you painted of living in a ballroom courtyard, co- legitimate colonial house from Spanish colonists. Well, yeah. Well, the, <laughs> and then doing the same thing they were doing. And you know doing. what was actually really, really sad about that house? So um, the church that everyone was going to um, within that congregation, like there was a woman who owned that house pre-revolution, and then the Sandinistas took it away. So she was the the true owner of that home. And the revolution took her house. That happens all the time. Made a separate title. And we were living in that house. So when she would come over, we'd invite her over, she would just start crying. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Or maybe I didn't forgot. It was actually really uncomfortable. This was 14 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. So she lived in the neighborhood in not that house. That's In like a very modest like house. Mm-hmm. That's a tragedy. Small. I feel guilty just like knowing family that. Family heritage. That home was family heritage for her. I mean, I don't know if it was heritage, but she owned it. Okay. Like she was, she was educated and mm. um, had a really nice place. Like, mm. and then war came. Yeah, um, I I enjoyed the Nicaraguan life and culture and people, especially with Kate around. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of hanging out. But yeah, that was the very, very tail end of my experience as as a Jehovah's Witness. Being born and raised into it, I never had a choice. It was all based on what I call the fog. Fear, obligation, and guilt. <laughs> You're not the only one who calls it that. The fog, and it's all just a system of coercion. And I think Nicaragua and seeing what I saw and learning what I learned about it just push me away from it as the f- final act of freedom from that way of thinking. Um, I, I treasure my experiences in Nicaragua and I think about them often, but I, I also realize I learned a lot of hard lessons about that religion as well. Mm-hmm. I have something really similar to that. So I no part of that religion in the country, in the United States made me want to like, rise up in their hierarchical ranks, become a ministerial servant or elder, using their language to become a leader of some kind or just take on responsibilities of some kind. But the idea of traveling the world, experiencing another culture, um, having an adventure, that really appealed to me. I always wanted that. I felt that I I had done it with you and I had traveled in Europe and had an adventure, a bunch of adventures. It was awesome. And I really wanted to try living abroad. And just before that, 2006, I left Minneapolis, went to Florida. In Florida, I met people in Ecuador, in the religion. And I was like, I'm gonna give it, a, I'm gonna give it a try, kind of like you did, like not go through the proper channels. I did not get approved for this. In fact, I left my card somewhere else, or whatever. They have these like this thing that travels with you if you're a member of the religion, that tells all, like a report on you or whatever. Your report card. <laughs> yeah, your report card. <laughs> And so they are supposed to move those. I didn't do that. I Anyway, I went there with like, people are doing 50 or 70 or hundreds of hours of preaching every month. And I went to Ecuador with the idea of getting to know what life is like there and try it. And I did Jehovah's Witness stuff when I was there, but not in not on those levels. And they gave me lots of hell about it um, constantly. Like, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you take on this new responsibility? You're, you know, you're 24, you could be leading the congregation. And there's local people who are 50, who have families who are from that local place, they don't let them lead. It was, I started to see the same things you started to see, where like a rich person from another country can come in and like, and then have control or have responsibilities or have respect that is unearned. Well, and also, it's not just that, but it's also that that person is telling them that their culture is inherently wrong yeah exactly that they have to think act and believe how their religious organization tells them to so when you go in there and see a rich culture that people are part of an interconnected rich culture and these colonial idea religious people going in there they're telling them that their customs are wrong Mm -hmm. their celebrations are wrong their relationships with other people are wrong. They're telling them to break apart from their families and their communities based on their belief structure. And I think that's the most heartbreaking thing to me, um, to see that sort of damage being done by 
people who also are flaunting their wealth in front of the people as they're damaging their relationships and their culture. Exactly. It's yeah. almost insult to injury. Mm-hmm. And I just thought it was disgusting. That's exactly the realization I came to for all those same reasons, plus the feeling of colonialism, this having people come in with money acting the way that we were acting is we were basically tourists flaunting our money in their neighborhood and telling them that they're wrong about how they do everything. They're wrong. Their relationship with their own family is wrong. Their mom, you shouldn't be talking to their mom or their children. Well, and you're also a salesman. That's what you are. You're a salesman or a saleswoman. You're a salesperson. You're just selling the, mm-hmm. that's what you're doing. You're just, just selling something. Yes. Yeah, so I went back to the States after six months in Ecuador, we were super disillusioned about the whole thing. Like, that was the only thing in the religion that I held on to as like valuable that we or a global religion that we're a global community that has value and we do good. And I went there and saw just tragic manipulation and people's relationships being torn apart and like people legitimately not being happy because you have to give up so much to be a part of this congregation and left pretty soon after that, left the religion after that. Yeah, that, my time in Nicaragua definitely sparked like my exit from that that cult. Um, for the same reasons that you you both have talked about, but also I was really young, so I think like my consciousness wasn't that like dialed in. Um, but for me, it was like it, it had a lot to do with lifestyle. Yes. Yeah. Like I um, I was told that like if I wanted to. Uh, travel. I had to be a Jehovah's Witness because I could go anywhere in the world and find people that I can trust. Mm. And mm-hmm. there's there's jobs and roles that I can fulfill, even being a single woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I got there, and there's all these fucking like nineteen year olds traveling the world. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by themselves. <laughs> Like not part of the religion. Like not just part of the religion. Just going, normal humans yeah. traveling the world. You don't have to have this affiliation. No. To enjoy yourself. Not in fact, at all. It's better like, if you don't, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> in every possible way. So then I was like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, so I stayed for like another year, and yeah, distanced myself from from that religion, mm. and then I came back to the states and was like, done. That was my exact experience. I, you know, being born and raised and, you know, unsuccessfully brainwashed, (laughs) but, (laughs) but almost, I mean, almost brainwashed for, I, you know, I was 28 at the time I came back to Boulder, Colorado, and I think I went to just a handful of Jehovah's Witness, like the Sunday meeting their big Sunday meetings and I had a panic attack, a complete panic attack. And I completely realized I was sitting in the midst of a cult. And I told myself I would never in my life ever step foot into a kingdom hall again under any circumstances. Mm. And I made a complete break with the religion and composed a three page letter and emailed it to the watchtower society saying that I had completely cut ties with them. So I finalized the whole thing. I would say in my life, the time I realized I was an atheist was most likely when I was 19 years old. That's when I can tell you I was an atheist. In my, in my emotional brain, I was not an atheist. That was in my rational brain. And it took me another eight or nine years to come to terms with my emotional brain on that one. And that's when I was 100% atheist, both sides of the brain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I became an atheist at 19. And then, like officially like stated it out loud at like 22 okay would you both call yourselves would you relate to atheism now do you think that oh yeah i'm an atheist i'm 
I've been an atheist for a very long time, yes. Yeah. I identify as an atheist. Yeah. Hey, we should get stickers. Atheism! <laughs> <laughs> one, of our, one of my really good friends has a, has a tattoo of the symbol of atheism, and it's like, there's this like fake thing about a unicorn, and it's like a really cool logo with like, that represents the atheist unicorn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a cool logo. <laughs> the problem with leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, though, is you have nothing outside of them, and they know that, and they hold it as leverage over you, and they basically set you up for failure. Well, that's, of course, what the function of a cult really is, is this internalized small group of people. But I think through traveling and being open-minded, I really... I really sort of dismissed their thinking. A lot of people never quite get there. Um, But I feel like I was able to, in a healthy way, dissolve a lot of their theology and ideas. And I feel like that was something that a lot of witnesses don't take the time to do. They might just feel like the fog coming over them, the fear, obligation, and guilt and they might just run away from it and lead the lifestyle they want, but they never fully, like, they never fully unlearn what they have learned. They don't unbrainwash themselves. Mm -hmm. And they kind of end up maybe fucking up in their personal lives a little bit and then feeling a little shaky, and then they want to run back to the God God idea or the Jehovah's Witness concept. And that's something that I, I fully dismissed by reading a lot of literature Mm -hmm. a lot of books Um, you completed the process of like you deconverted yourself yes all the way yes I completely did I completely undid all of their thinking and I'm proud of myself because it took a lot of time and a lot of work Mm -hmm. and it was stressful but I'm glad I did it I think it's crucial like there there isn't another well there is an option to, to not do that, but you're going to constantly live as a Jehovah's Witness and be unhappy. Unless you do something about Unless it. Unless you do something about it, yeah. You have to deprogram. Yeah, you do. And take care of the trauma. Yeah. It's super traumatic. Yeah, if it means seeing a therapist or doing psychedelic mushrooms or whatever. Ketamine um, therapy. All the stuff. Amazing. All the therapies. Maybe mm-hmm. it's Maybe it's chemical therapy. Maybe it's... Maybe it's just talking to your best friend all the time or something, you have to have a support structure to get out of it. Cause it's, it's so like, it's so like programmed into you. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't think it's just like the cult and alone. I think that like a lot of, we were talking about this this week, like a lot of family structures within that religion are fucked up. <laughs> so like you Very most toxic. likely came from a dysfunctional family Mm-hmm. And you might not realize it. So yeah, yeah. therapy is important. Self care is important. I had a really amazing realization. I was doing. I was on regular therapy schedule like once a month this year, the early part of the year. And then I met this old friend from Hanoi. She's an art therapist, and so we started ca- chatting about it. Actually, I learned about it from a, an ex Jehovah's Witness in the Philippines who moved to Cambodia, who real was using this particular person as a therapist, like as a service or whatever. And she reached out to me to say, to ask me if I'm also one of her clients. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know she did art therapy or any kind of therapy. She's just an old friend of mine. I met in Hanoi. So I reached out to her and she's like, yeah, I do art therapy. Let's do a session. So I was like, okay, let's give it a try. I don't really know what that is. In the very first session, I drew this picture related to unrelated to this religion. It's like a thing about a moment with an ex-girlfriend in Vietnam that was, I've always wondered what, what happened, like what was going on in this moment, only to realize that that, like, that image represented how I feel based on the pressure that the religion was putting on me. And it like completely like changed how I think. In one single art therapy session, a single image that I drew in two minutes completely changed how I think about my past, which is amazing. Like a huge realization came to me. And it also has to do with like attachment theory or attachment styles in how relationship dynamics work. And I started reading a book recommended by the first therapist this week, which has been fun to talk to you guys about. 
that helped me realize that my parents and probably lots of parents or family dynamics are dealing with mental illness or, or kind of some form of dysfunction that's unhealthy that changes how they parented you. And maybe, maybe being a part of religion might have been a healthy thing for a childhood. This particular religion was a tragic choice, <laughs> but having some kind of structure um, might have been necessary to like keep the family running or something like that. My father said that... Um like as much because my dad was not a Jehovah's Witness and my mother was she converted um, in like 1979 surprise (laughs) (laughs) but he said that like as much as the religion was a challenge for him it like myself and my younger sister probably wouldn't have been born because like the family would have dissolved without without the structure yeah Mm mm-hmm and plus, you know, they don't allow you to get a divorce, so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's when you're part of that religious cult, you've signed so many contracts. You have signed a lot of contracts. And you can never leave without punishment. <laughs> you can never get divorced, even if you have an unhappy marriage or there's abuse. You can't even have sex anymore. Yeah, only certain parts of the body are touchable. <laughs> Why? When I learned that, I was, I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> it was like my first like Jehovah's Witness sex ed class was like done. <laughs> it's it's the most claustrophobic place you'd ever want to find yourself in life, um, and I feel like it is a place for truly broken people, and. I mean, it's, you know, if that's the place they want to be, then that's the place they want. But being born into it as I was, you know, I think was just a form of brainwashing because I didn't actually have a choice. Mm -hmm. I was told that if I did not want to believe in the Jehovah's Witness materials, that I would be killed by God. There were there were no gray areas. My parents actually told me that God would definitely destroy me if I left the religion. Who says that to a little child? Mm. And if you fuck up, God's going to murder you. <laughs> the, like... I had a really big imagination as a child, a really active imagination. And the Jehovah's Witness books for children show bloody murdered people being killed they show god well the ancient nation of israel was just basically serial killers and it's just if there was a if god had a problem it always was solved by violence it was murder and murder animals were being sacrificed people murdered everyone was being killed and murdered and that was considered normal by my parents to show me pictures of people being murdered by God over and over and over again. And Babylon the Great is some sort of crazy figure from the Bible, which they depict as a drunken woman riding on a cheetah or a leopard or something. And she's on the Jehovah's Witness pictures. (laughs) She's covered in uh, drinking a wine glass, being covered in blood. <laughs> and this was me as a little child looking at these pictures. So what choice did I really have in the matter when your parents believe? I was told that my toys probably possessed demons all the time. That demons would come out of the TV if I watched the wrong cartoon. It... It was, my parents were absurdly superstitious. Mm. I can't even believe how superstitious they were. <laughs> what's, what's also crazy on top of all of that, like that's the Old Testament Jewish God that you're describing, right? But then to, then you have Jesus who's like, we don't need that system, it's broken. There's, there's other ways to do this. And then he gets murdered by the state. And then the guy that takes over the religion is a serial killer who hunts and murders Christians for a living. And he's like, I could totally control this population and make them my own religion. And he creates Christianity. It's like, okay, 
<laughs> yeah, of course, the, the, we need a serial killer as a leader. <laughs> the overwhelming theme of the Bible is human violence. Yeah, I mean, sure, pick out a couple of sentences in the Bible that have Jesus saying nice things or something, but the the underlying plot theme of the Bible is based on violence, um, not love or connectedness or respect for nature. It's based on violence. God solves all of his problems by violence. And if you actually read the fucked up commandments, God would actually be put to death under his own rules. (laughs) (laughs) Under his own law, his so-called perfect law, God would be put to death. Don't people think of that? They just say, well, it all makes sense because he's more powerful than us. So it's just based on, based on authoritarianism. Mm-hmm. Obey out of fear. It's just based on this thing has more power than you, so you have to serve it. Mm-hmm. That thing is amoral. Mm-hmm. If it's deciding to use violence to solve all of its problem, it's, it's amoral. Okay. So now we've arrived in our modern lives. Mm. What do we, how do we live in a way that's like harmonious and fulfilling? You have to be ethical. Queer Plants Cafe, come and get a coffee, a sandwich, a plant. (laughs) I'm going to use that as a soundbite advertisement for your cafe. (laughs) Pollinate your universe. (laughs) What is that? Enter my plantacy. (laughs) <laughs> keep rolling this is fun we'll do a really crazy yeah I mean <laughs> I found for myself um, my attunement with nature is what I would like to do with my life and since it's not a gardener anymore I'm moving in a different direction but I'm I love being part of nature and I hate consumerism and capitalism and money, but unfortunately, I have to make it work. So that's sort of like my kind of meet this world halfway point. Mm. I don't know. In my own mind, that's how I like can live with myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> People are gonna buy coffee anyways. And they they might never buy a plant. So you're giving them this opportunity to like connect with nature in this small way. Yeah, and um, I want to make just make an oasis for people because life's hard, life's tough. Sometimes you need a getaway place um, where you can have a cup of coffee and write your journal or read a read something or chat with a close friend. And I want to make my cafe that place for people. And I want to see people who are trans there every day. Mm-hmm. I want to see people who are queer or queer identifying every day. I want to see those people have a comfortable, safe space to hang out. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Or disabled, too, obviously. but Or old people or young people. I don't care. But just not the straight people. <laughs> Everyone's welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you brought ethics. What is it about ethics? Uh, yeah. So ask the question again. Oh, what have you found in this modern life that helps you live a fulfilling life? Yeah, I think I think establishing values is really important um, when you come out of like a cult. <laughs> Definitely your own values. Yeah, because you're told what your values are when you're in a high control religion, and then you leave, and you're questioning everything, or maybe even before you you leave for some. Um, but then it's like, okay, so what do I actually believe in? What is important? What is right? What is wrong? And like our community, our society actually does a good job in like laying it out for us, but it's easy to question if they're right or not. So mm-hmm. I think that's like, that's something that's important to tackle right away mm-hmm. and establish like, what do you believe in? What do you believe is right mm-hmm. outside of a bubble? And then live that way in accordance to that. Yes, definitely. I totally agree with that. There's 
a fun practice that I, anyone who's listening to this, you should do at some point is to create your own 10 important rules to live by for you that you think are important for yourself and for society. Sort of like the 10 commandments takes a stab at it. And this is from, oh, what's the book by the British evolutionist, evolutionary biologist. What's the book that we were reading when we were so witnesses of Minneapolis? That's like about atheism. They have a whole chapter on Jehovah's Witnesses in the book. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, God, not, somebody has God in the title, I think. Not God is not great. That's Hitchens. Dawkins. Oh, is it a Richard Dawkins book? Yeah. Um, Just to attribute the practice. It must have been so long ago. I can't remember at anyway, this moment. It's, it's like 2003 book by Dawkins. And in that book, he says, I want you to take a moment and write, write your own Ten Commandments. Because if you read the Ten Commandments in the Bible, there's only a couple in there that are of any value. The rest are like, God is jealous. Don't worship other gods. Don't steal. Maybe like would make it to your list or something. Um, and like, don't commit adultery is in there, but that's really some form of theft or, you know, it's relationship dynamics, but there's a few rules that are in there that are okay. and like makes sense to be universal, but then like the rest are just trash and they don't really make any sense for society at large. You, you could basically, his point is in, in probably five or 10 minutes, you can outdo the 10 commandments, which is what people will use as like the highest law on earth in the Western societies or Western religions. And so I did that with a bunch of friends. Even when I moved to LA, I was like, one night we were having a game night. And we're like, okay, let's, I want to try this thing, see what you all come up with. We all went alone and we wrote our personal Ten Commandments and came back with like this list that were just superior to God. <laughs> God's list. And it comes down to some form of ethics. Yeah, and it makes you, you know, when you have that, then you have like a way to participate with society. You know, like politics is actually really important getting involved with your community in that way and so if you know what you believe in it's like easier to to participate <laughs> definitely i mean that i i found it hard during the pandemic to participate in the social justice protests because of how just how chaotic they were but when i actually did go to start going to the protests regularly and making signs and showing up ready to go, ready to storm down the streets, it felt so much different. The power, the power of motivation behind mm -hmm. a crowd of people mm. that are standing up for their values mm -hmm. was something that re that experience really taught me. Um, that like this isn't right, and we have to we have to go at the government until they fix it. The government has to do something about this because it's totally wrong um and of course i'm talking about the police brutality against black people across the united states or just you know the racial the racial disparities between the police and the everyday people across the united states it's totally out of control and being part of that really helps solidify my values mm. I think everybody should go to their local protest and participate. If it's a protest that you agree with. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. I did a lot of that with Occupy. And it's so long ago now, it's 10 years ago, 11 years ago. But that was really formative to me. It was right on the heels of, I left the religion, went traveling for half a year, came back to Colorado, and then was starting to live the life I really, the way I really wanted to, like getting back to my roots or my core, who I really was. And then that just erupted around the world, around the country especially. And I got super involved and it was amazing because it like helped me at that moment like for, like solidify how I want to participate in society. I value that as well. Absolutely. It leaves a mark on you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. You can still remember it. Yeah. It's great. It's, good. it's a good practice to mm -hmm. instill an audience of people who might be wondering how to, where to go next. Definitely. Because there's this whole framework we were given, but it's like someone else's framework. We need to create our own for our own, to help guide ourselves. No one else is stepping in to guide you. 
100%. If, yeah. Like, <laughs> yep, no one's going to start living my life for me. <laughs> In fact, if someone else is giving you a framework and is stepping in to guide you, you're probably being manipulated. Yeah, I mean, not even anyone else is going to tell me that my job sucks and I need to get a new one. That's mm. going to have to be me telling myself that. Mm. You got to listen to your own voice. Listen to your that voice in your head that tells you to that you're stagnant, that you need to change, that you're doing something damaging maybe to someone else, maybe unintentionally even. That voice, that compass should be in your head, whether or not you believe the Ten Commandments or the Bible or God or anything, that you should have that voice in your head that says, like, don't fuck up anyone else's life. Mm -hmm. And, like, don't forget to set goals. Yes, set goals. Set goals. Because, like, most likely you are going to grow old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and someone's going to have to take care of you. <laughs> Figure that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that gets scarier every year I'm on this planet. <laughs> Think about it now. <laughs> yes, I am thinking about that. Help me out by coming to Queer Plants Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited to come and hang out at Queer Plants. Yeah. Is it really, you've put together the decor, you've shown me some of your pitches to the bankers. It looks really good. Thanks. It's going to be a fun place. And knowing Ross, no one knows how much we know each other. We know each other in the religion, we travel together, we live together for years. We're still hanging out. You've always had a really great eye for design. Like, I've thought about coming to you for my logo work and like my website design. I will be coming to you for my website stuff soon. You just, even though you're not doing that professionally anymore, you've always had a really good eye for it. Well, what makes you think I'm going to have time to help you with a website? So I'm going to get you before February. <laughs> <laughs> also, you promised yesterday. <laughs> I roll. <laughs> just, you don't have to do anything. I just want you to look at it. No commitment necessary on the podcast. <laughs> Cool. What's, what's exciting for you both? You were told us what's exciting for you. What's exciting for you next? You were going to tell us about your business. We forgot to dive in there. Oh, yeah. This um, actually makes sense on the heels of politically, politically involved. Yeah, it's definitely like on my mind. Um, so I started a company uh, that helps ballot initiatives get on the ballot. And basically what a ballot initiative is, um, if you live in a state, there's 20 of them that allows you to do a ballot initiative. You can get a number of signatures pass something that you think is cool so say like you think marijuana should be legal <laughs> in your state or you think that people should have reproductive freedom in your state protected by the constitution the state constitution you can write a sentence that protects that and get people to agree with you um it's super cool part of democracy <laughs> in fact i think it's the most functional part of democracy absolutely it gives the people the choice to create laws in which they have to live under um, and have us, yeah, just pass it by themselves. How many states have this power? Are 20. 20 states out of 50? Yep. Those states are often the ones that create a new law and that changes, that usually imposes the other 20 states, if I'm right. If I, if I'm wrong. You're wrong. And that becomes, it, become, it can become a federal law at some point because those states have like created a brand new policy. Like long-term thinking, one ballot initiative could like become a trickle it can trickle into the future and affect U.S. policy. Correct. Yes, absolutely. Because it can, it shows the, the U.S. government what a good percentage of the population wants yeah. um, and demands out of, out of their state, out of their constitution. Can you give us an example of a successful ballot initiative that has actually changed the country for what you think is, well, doesn't have to be for the better, just like change the country? Well, I mean, can, we can look at cannabis and the legalization or decriminalization of drugs in general. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, what, the first ballot initiative happened in Denver? Or, or I'm sorry, Colorado, to mm -hmm. legalize? Or cannabis? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then I think it was California and Oregon followed. Um, and then Washington State. And it, now it's, like, almost legal in every state, with the exception of a couple, or at least decriminalized. Or there's oh, a even the non-ballot initiative states no longer... Or still have... Or how does that work? Uh, in those 20 states. Okay. 
that allow those ballot initiatives. Um, Most of them are now have some form of legal cannabis. Yeah, and now we have an entire economy built around cannabis money. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can you probably own a stock in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, even if you don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in such a hyper-capitalism society, you can't deny that there's a market for something because uh, that's, how, that's how it works. Supply and demand. Um, so when you have a ballot initiative turn into a multi-billion dollar corporation, it's like one state flaunts that big business in front of the next state over, and the next state over says, well, not everyone's a fuck up after they smoke marijuana, you know, which is what they thought probably that if everyone smokes marijuana, no one will go to work anymore. No one will have motivation. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone will just have the munchies, but the world keeps humming along and now there's billions of dollars in someone else's pocket. Okay. So for the record, ballot initiatives do not necessarily lead to intense capitalism. (laughs) <laughs> but I think in the case of that industry, though, it's like you can't deny it, right? Right. Right. For sure. I get it. But that was one of those, you know, especially with tax revenue for states. Uh-huh. They're always thinking of ways for tax revenue. And they're like, what can we tax? What can we tax? Well, okay. So, but then you can look at like reproductive freedom rights. Mm-hmm. Going back to a positive, <laughs> a positive example. <laughs> Sign petitions. Um, like, there's a real statement to the federal government that's made. Like, uh, Michigan protected their rights. Uh, was it Kansas protected mm. their rights? Like, that's wow. crazy. Yeah. Like, that's a big, like, fuck you to the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's inspiring to, like, everyone who cares about, about like, health care. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, the the ramifications for those states overturning abortion are going to be devastating. Mm-hmm. And it's like... Overturning Roe v. Wade. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's just based on oppression. Mm-hmm. There's no... There's nothing good about it. And having a ballot initiative option for people in those areas can be so powerful if you can tap into that network. Yeah. The and, problem. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was saying that's, I was just going to introduce like, that's what your software is going to do for people that live in maybe those states where they just don't have a voice. Yeah, potentially. Um, mm-hmm. The problem with the system is it goes back to money. So uh, in order to get a, a ballot initiative, onto a ballot, right? A petition onto a ballot, you need a a certain amount of signatures and it goes by like the percentage of your state, like percentage of like voters in your state. Um, When I worked on the Arizonans for Reproductive Freedom campaign over the summer, um, we needed 350,000 signatures, which is not a lot. Like California needs about a million. Mm -hmm. And then you actually need like 30% more almost because there's going to be, there's going to be question whether or not those signatures, you know, belong to the person that signed them. Anyways, you need more. But the barrier to entry cost-wise to get an initiative passed is super, super high. It's like $10 a signature in some states, Mm -hmm. which is like 10 times a million. Mm -hmm. Like that's a ton of money that you have to raise. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just like kind of run by this sleazy group of contractors. Um, And I think that's bullshit. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like I minimum mean, wage to people it. who go out on the street to collect signatures, right? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, there has to be a movement. But what we learned in uh, Arizona is that we were able to get 145,000 signatures uh, at the cost of 30 cents, which is because we used volunteers. Mm-hmm. So we set up like a grassroots style campaign. Mm-hmm really really fast like we knew we weren't going to win but we had to try um and it worked like people if if you know what your ethics are and your values like you're going to feel strongly about it enough to like Mm -hmm. do something about it hopefully Mm -hmm. um so yeah we think we can replicate that in all 20 states for multiple campaigns using like cool software that makes it easier to do things. <laughs> mm-hmm. It'd be interesting to, I mean, I don't know how much, how big of an audience this is that could help you, but 
at some point, maybe it's, you tell me it is now or later, but how can we help people to help you? Just talk about ballot initiatives. Go on to your web, your state's website if you live in a state that has ballot initiatives um, and look at them, like educate yourself. Be like, oh wait, like there's one in my county that's clean water. Mm. Like, yeah, we need clean water. Like figure out where you can sign that petition and just get involved because for myself, when, when I implement this business, like it's going to be people to start out with, it's going to be people approaching you on the street being like, Hey, like, have you signed this? So pay attention to mm-hmm. what people are, mm-hmm. are asking. Yes. I oftentimes find ballot initiatives in my town, especially in the parks and riding the subway or the light rail systems mm-hmm. or just in like the downtown sort of plaza. Mm-hmm. Those are great spots to find them. True, and also if it's an unpopular, or if it's underfunded but important initiative, they're generally at your Democratic offices or Republican offices if that's like if that's where you lean. Mm-hmm. So go, you know, like find out where your local party office is. Go there, sign it, and then do the rest of your stuff. It's one of the most powerful <laughs> forms of a democracy. Maybe the most powerful tool. You can vote for the president. You can vote for your senator, your elected officials, but you don't know what they're going to do. And they're usually leaning to a certain party and they're going to do what's you know, going to do the easiest way to do their job. Mostly like, you don't. there's a way to influence them to do what you believe in by signing an initiative and getting it passed. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Maybe the most powerful form of democracy we have. I think so. Yeah. It's cool. It's yeah. really, really cool. I mm-hmm. wish it was like implemented on a federal level. Yeah. It'd be amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But until that be. happens, we can do what we can in the States to have it. Yeah, and just talk about it. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. if you sign something that's cool, tell your friends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And don't stop telling them. <laughs> Does change.org play a role in any of this? Have you ever seen initiatives come through there? I'm not sure what their role is. There's a push to allow electric signatures for petitions. And um, I'm not sure if change.org is on board with that or helping like supply that software to mm-hmm. campaigns or anything like that. I'm not educated on that matter. That would be a really amazing thing if we could all sign electronically like it makes sense to do that the most progressive states allow like up to 30 percent e-signatures which is big because they're free basically like you don't have to put a lot of money into get that sort of gathering mm-hmm. work um, and that would be huge to change that it would require a ballot initiative <laughs> yeah. to be drafted in that state mm-hmm. and passed the old-fashioned way yeah, there's a lot of controversy with the voting systems right now, so hopefully that will go through. But I thankfully am from a state, Oregon, that only has mail-in voting. No really? One. Only? Mm-hmm. That's We're all, cool. We've always been... Well, I've lived there for nine years. We've always been mail voting only. So they just send it right to your address, and the return postage is free. And you just drop it in the mailbox... No one has to go to the polls. It's so wonderful. That sounds system. too extreme for me. <laughs> <laughs> How do we trust it? It's it's very inconvenient. <laughs> I think I believe there's only a handful of states, maybe three or four, that have all mail all mail in voting. Hmm. I have to look those up. I don't know. Great. So we're coming to your cafe. We're going to participate in democracy with our own designed ethics. Heck yeah. (laughs) Ballot initiatives. We're going to visit Miami for the arts and the ocean. Yeah, but don't move here. (laughs) (laughs) Unless you live on the 10th floor. (laughs) And if you do, do not pay more for rent than you need to. (laughs) Talking to you, Brooklyn. (laughs) Cool. Thanks, you guys, for hanging out. It was fun chatting. Super fun. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Scott. We'll do a catch up some point and see where you're at with your businesses. Dope. Great. Check out witnessunderground.com about artists who escaped cults. We have three different forms of journalism from a film, a YouTube series, and a podcast. The podcast is very active. We're launching season two, January 2023. And the story link on that site talks about the body of work that we've already created and what we're continuing to create, the mission the intention and our artist grant application where you can submit to take home $1,000 to work on your art project on the topic. The only criteria would be that you have a great idea that our panel awards 
but also that you have some association with this particular religion, Jehovah's Witnesses, at some point in your life. Doesn't matter how long it's been. And we also have a blog, a regular writing series. The press has been really interesting. When we did our film festival run in 2021, we got a lot of press. We are on a lot of radio programs and a lot of podcasts. And you can see all of that content there, which is really exciting. And it's fun to have launched this new website. And the art page will have shortly all of our products we have for sale from t-shirts to the music from all the bands in the film to artists who are actively making new music that we've highlighted on the podcast and films that you can watch from other activists. It's an exciting time to be launching the grant and the new site and the film. That should be out in April. We're launching it. The target date for release is ahead of the Jehovah's Witness holiday that they call the Memorial and the Jewish people call the Passover event. So April 4th is the actual date and we are shooting for ahead of that for a public release, ideally on ad-based services such as Tubi for you to watch. So stay, stay ahead of that, pay, pay attention to the website, subscribe on the website, subscribe to the YouTube channel and search on YouTube for Witness Underground Podcast. That's where we've been launching everything. We have just launched on Buzzsprout as a distribution so we should be on Spotify shortly. Thank you so much for following. Like, subscribe, share as much as you can. And let any artist that you know who has any affiliation with this religion, that they can apply for the $1,000 grant that we are putting together as a goodwill to the community and an exciting way to bring new art to the community that is part of the healing process. Thanks for sticking around and check out witnessunderground.com.